We're delighted to uh, to have uh, with us tonight uh, both uh, Evan Thomas uh, and his wife Osi, uh, who together have put together this um, in, in, in incredible book. Um, I, I, I'm sure that you're. Um, I'll talk about Evan first, and then I'll talk about Osi. Um, um, you know, Evan, um, uh, who I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. Um, we're certainly familiar with him here at, at PNP. He's uh, he's appeared a number of times here. Um, he's not only a wonderfully fluid writer and, and delightfully engaging person, he's someone who's enjoyed two remarkable careers simultaneously, um, one living in the present as an accomplished journalist, and the other living, um, I guess, in the past as a first-rate historian. Um, in journalism, um, he spent uh, nearly 10 years with Time Magazine and then moved to, to Newsweek in the mid-1980s, uh, where he stayed for for more than 20 years uh, as a Washington bureau chief, assistant managing editor, and, and editor at large. Um, he's also uh, been a, a mainstay on, on TV as a commentator, and uh, I guess he, he uh, because he likes to get out of Washington uh, every now and then, he's taught writing and journalism at, uh, at Harvard and at Princeton. Uh, and as a historian, he, uh, he's made his mark writing um, uh, impressive uh, biographies about Edward Bennett Williams, Robert Kennedy, John Paul Jones, Dwight Eisenhower, and, and Richard Nixon. Uh, in The War Lover, Lovers, uh, Evan examined America's rush into the Spanish-American War. In Sea of Thunder, he chronicled the conflict in the Pacific uh, during World War II. Uh, in Very Best Men, he profiled four figures who ran covert U.S. operations in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and in The Wise Men, uh, Evan teamed up with Walter Isaacson to tell the stories of a handful of outsized U.S. government personalities uh, who shaped the post-Cold uh, War world. Uh, and with Evan in the writing of, um, of, of, of uh, most of these books, uh, his wife, Osi, um, was, uh, fr frequent, was a frequent and, and very close uh, collaborator. Uh, and she was... Uh, she was uh, uh, very deeply involved in, in their latest, uh, newest book, First, uh, the biography of Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and uh, as a Stanford-educated uh, lawyer from the, the West, um, O.C., according to Evan himself, um, uh, understands O'Connor as well as her husband, or as Evan says, maybe better. Um, they... Um, uh, uh, the, the 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 book really captivates. Um, it's a it's a captivating uh, portrait of the first woman to have served on the Supreme Court, and Evan and O.C. had uh, extraordinary access to O'Connor's personal papers uh, and extensive access to her family, friends, law clerks, and colleagues, um, all of which uh, helped enrich their. Um, a compelling account of O'Connor's journey from a, a childhood on an Arizona cattle ranch through a stellar academic career, time as a lawyer, judge, and trailblazer in, um, in the Arizona uh, state government, uh, and ultimately uh, to her historic tenure on the Supreme Court from uh, 1981 to 2006. Um, O'Connor, as, as uh, Evan O.C. note in the prologue, uh, wasn't just the first female member of the court but the most powerful justice of her time. For most of her 24 years on the court, she was the controlling vote on many of the great societal issues, including abortion, affirmative action, and religious freedom. Uh, and of course, um, O'Connor's been a, a remarkable role model for a generation of, of young women, a paragon uh, of sharp intellect, practical instincts, and virtuous principles, but also tough, bossy and relentless. Um, and uh, I, I was just told uh, that that their book, first, uh, will, uh, in this Sunday's uh, New York Times bestseller list, be appearing as number 10. Um, and maybe you can help push it up to even higher number by buying the book at the end. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Evan and O.C. Thomas. Thank you, Brad. Is Politics and Prose the greatest bookstore there ever was? Yes. 
We've been here uh, many times, and I'm going to pathetically plug my daughter, who's coming here on May 10th, the 20th with her husband, John Urschel. She's written a book with him called Mind and Matter about, uh, about him, which is he's a, he's a MIT, MIT football player. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah, mathematician. Uh, and we're going to say hello to our other daughter, Mary, in the back row. Uh, are, they, are these on? What? Are they on? The Can you hear us? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about uh, Sandra's nomination to the Supreme Court in July 1981 and what an extraordinary moment that was for the country. Uh, in the court's 200 and some 20 year history, uh, n no woman had served on the court. And so there were more requests for press passes uh, for her confirmation hearings than there had been at the Watergate hearings. Mm -hmm. She was on the cover of Time magazine. It said justice at last. Newsweek on the cover and people on the cover. And she was watched by tens of millions of people around the world as she gave a very deft and uh, successful representation of her views at her confirmation hearing and was confirmed 99 to 0. So... Uh, it was a, a, an exciting moment for the country, and um, in contrast to actually arriving at what is called the Marble Palace by some. Well, she, it was cold. It was cold building. It's marble. Uh, and she was used to Arizona. She used to go out into the little interior courtyards and turn her face up to the sun just to, just to feel some sun. It was, oh, the, she was not warmly received by her, her brethren either. Some of them, yes, but uh, she went to her first lunch and only half of the justices showed up. Uh, this was not unusual. The, the Supreme Court, you know, they're there together. They don't necessarily like each other and they didn't trust each other. This is 1981. The Brethren, remember the Brethren by Woodward and Armstrong had just come out and they weren't sure who the leaker was. So they, they she, she was surprised by that. Where is everybody? Uh, at her very first oral argument. She knew everybody was watching. She knew the press was watching. And she waited about a half an hour, finally asked a question. And the idiot lawyer in front of her talks right over her. Uh, inexplicably. Uh, and she writes in her journal that night, I feel put down. Now, put down was not something that she often felt. In fact, she put it in quotes, like a sort of a foreign feeling. But it shows you, you know, how, how tough it was. She had, she came to that court. She had been an intermediate state court of appeals judge. Her least favorite course in law school was constitutional law. She was playing an incredible catch-up game. Uh, it didn't help that at the very first conference, you know, the Supreme Court meets in secret, alone, in a room where nobody else comes in. It's really the truly the room where it happens. So they have a nice tradition there. They shake each other's hands. So she's shaking hands, and she shakes hands with Justice Byron White, Wizard White, the former all-pro halfback, uh, and he crushes her hand. So she goes into her first ever conference and there are tears squirting out of her eyes. She's crying. Uh, now, there was a dilemma for the other justices. They talked about what to do before she came on. They had just gotten rid of the word Mr. before justice by an eight to one vote. The one vote was Harry Blackman, we'll, we'll get to him. Uh, and they said, well, you know, the job of the junior justice is to take notes and to get coffee. Mm. So they, Justice Stevens told us this story. They said, okay, tradition is tradition. We should make her get coffee. But they didn't. They, they, they didn't ask her to get coffee. Uh, she did have one friend, uh, Powell. So, so Lewis Powell, three weeks after she arrives, writes a letter to his children. And he says that she is nothing short of brilliant and that she will make her mark on the court. And it's a relief to all the justices because after all, she came from an intermediate state court without a real grounding in the constitution. But uh, Powell really befriends her, send, gives her, shares his secretary to help her set up her office and uh, is a real steadying helper for her. Berger, on the other hand, uh, has decided that she should really follow his lead. And he, um, w after her confirmation hearing, he has walked her down the stairs of the Supreme Court and he stops in the middle and he says, you've never seen me with a better looking justice. 
<laughs> so, so she hears that and she smiles, but uh, he only two months into her tenure, she is, um, it's November. He sends her uh, an academic paper he's gotten from a famous psychiatrist named Walter Menninger. And it says in the paper, he says, this may be of interest to you. And it says that if you're a solo woman joining a leadership group of men, your presence is going to undermine their confidence and their ability to work well together. So your best option is to be passive. (laughs) So exactly. So she, she usually thanked people for their letters to her. She didn't send him a thank you that we could find, <laughs> but she did keep it and said, file it. So, uh, so this is her beginning, but at the end of her second term, her, we had access to her husband, John's daily diary. He, he wrote every day in a diary from 2000, from her nomination through 2002. And he writes, she's in the catbirds. She feels she's in the catbird seat. She likes the jockeying, and she's become the fifth decisive vote, the swing vote, not a term she liked, but the the role she played in 330 cases. 25 years, 330 cases, that's a lot of swing votes. So as Brad said, it it essentially became the O'Connor court. Uh, so how did she how did she get there? Let's I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, growing up on this ranch, the Lazy Bee, 160,000 acres. One fifth the size of Rhode Island. Uh, few cows, not much rain, no running water when she's born, no heat. Uh, she uh, she's a lot of animals that will bite you, prick you, sting you. A lot of kids. Uh, J. Harvey Wilkinson noted that uh, a federal judge noted that when I was a child, I had as a pet a cat. When Sandra was a child, she had as a pet a bobcat. Uh, she had a very tough father. Uh, He loved her. He adored her. uh, But he was a formidable figure. And she liked to tell this story about him that when she was uh, 15, now when she was, by the time she was 15, she had, she learned how to fire a rifle at the age of 10, drive a tractor at the age of 11. And at 15, her job was to bring lunch out to the roundup. And the roundup is miles across the prairie. Uh, So she gets up at 5 a.m. She makes the roast. She makes the cake. She gets in her truck. She drives out there. She has a flat tire. She's a little, she's a diminutive girl and she has to jump on the jack to change the thing and it takes an hour and she's late and she gets there and her father looks up at her and says, you're late. And she said, well, I, I had a flat tire. He says, next time, leave earlier. <laughs> that was a me- story she told to her clerks. The message was clear. No excuses. Uh, that's the way it was on the ranch. Uh, she also, but more subtly, she also had a, as a role model her mom who was a very feminine person. She always wore a dress on the ranch and good shoes. Uh, She subscribed to Vogue and knew how to handle uh, Mr. Day. Uh, Mr. Day would occasionally have a drink or two in the evening and he could be a bit of a bully. And the way she handled it was not to be passive. Uh, She knew when to stood up to him, but she also knew how to roll with it and to be graceful and to not take the bait. Sandra O'Connor, who had to deal with a lot of difficult men in her day, learned not to take the bait by watching her mom. Uh, Then, miraculously, from this dusty ranch, she goes to Stanford. Where else she went at age 16? I wasn't 16. She was. (laughs) She called it in the first letter home to her um, parents' utopia. It was, as one of her friends said, a place uh, full of smiling men in bomber jackets. The veterans had arrived under the GI Bill, and uh, Stanford had uh, made room. And so her first uh, Saturday night, she went to a dance with her new friends uh, called the Jolly Up. And she, uh, she was an unusual girl because no one had yet asked her to dance, so she went up to a good-looking guy and who looked like fun and she asked him to dance and he turned out to be one of the vets and he fell in love and we interviewed him we found him in pasadena and we interviewed him at at uh at uh, the atheneum at caltech he was still in love and he He was was, 90 years old he told us he was still in love. he brought all his pictures of her from those days (laughs) 
So we had a wonderful time, as you can imagine, researching. And um, so her friends at Branner Hall said she arrived uh, looking great. Her mom had dressed, sent her with a, a great wardrobe, a lunch at the plaza dress. But when she opened her mouth, it was like the Dust Bowl, and they didn't know quite what to make of her. She was a terrific student. Um, she was ambitious, and she liked to have fun. So, But she was also obviously a serious student, and she took a course called Western Civ, Western Civilization, which unfortunately they no longer teach at Stanford. But it was a uh, sort of a soup to nuts, triumph of the West course. And for her, it opened her eyes up to the rule of law to this whole idea that of a, of a liberal democracy where, the, where there's a, three branches of government and they balance each other. I know something about this because uh, her, her final exam has survived. And I read her final exam, age 17. It's a brilliant exegesis on Madison and Jefferson. And of course, it stayed with her all her life. I, no doubt it was better than my exam on Western <laughs> <laughs> She also had a uh, mentor, Harry Rathbun, who was the uncle of one of her friends. He had Sunday seminars at his house just off the campus, and, and uh, the students, men and women, would arrive, and they'd sit on his floor, and they would learn about uh, the idea that you can individually do something good in the world. You can make a difference and that this is true of men, it's true of women, and he specifically said that men need to help women make their own way. So this all stayed with her as she made her way to law school. At, under a program that I think many schools had, you could do your first year of law school as your fourth year of college. So she did. And she's 19 years old, she's now at Stanford Law School, and she is got her uh, sea legs under her, and she, her dad gives her a 1951 Plymouth car. She gets a bucket of paint, and she goes and paints herself a parking space. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to waste any time looking for parking. It'll always be there for her. <laughs> so uh, meanwhile, she makes law review. She's Order of the Coif, and her, her, uh, she's got, um, while she's at Stanford with all these fellows, uh, four of them uh, proposed marriage to her. That we know of. That we know of. <laughs> She's engaged two or three times, and one of these fellows is Bill Rehnquist. Uh -huh. And so he, um, he has gone his third year in January. He's come back to Washington. He is clerking on the Supreme Court for Justice Jackson, and he is lonely. And he dated her first year from April to December, and in his... And we were aware because um, we were looking for love letters between John and Sandra. And we didn't have them. They weren't in the Library of Congress. We asked the um, family, where are the love letters? Where are they? Uh, and so we went uh, into the basement of the Supreme Court. She had a storage room. And there's a box marked correspondence, and we said, can we have that box? And, and we did get permission from her family. And in that box are the wonderful John and Sandra love letters and 14 wonderful love letters from Rehnquist to Sandra. <laughs> and they had not told anyone, not their families, not the justices. This was news to their respective families, and, and not necessarily unwelcome news because their, their parents were um, uh, certainly, uh, it, it was known that they had dated in law school um, and they both felt they had married the right people. Um, but it was, it was uh, exciting to find and, and um, about letter six he says, he's trying to figure out what went wrong with the romance, letter six. I have Sandy, to interject here, what wrong with the romance? She took him to the ranch. Yeah. And M Mr. Day handed him a roasted a bull's testicle to eat. Uh, let's say the weekend did not go well. Yeah, good point. I'm glad Evan uh, provided that. Uh, so so um, they move on, and they each respectively um, go their ways. But we did um, we did 
get permission from the Rehnquist family to um, to publish the contents of because those they letters. didn't. She didn't. His kids didn't know about it either. Yeah. I, I don't think we ever would have been able to see that box if the kids had actually looked in it first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, while so, what, yeah, I was just going to last detail is that. Um, her the the other justices knew that they had dated, gone to the movies. That's all Rehnquist would say. But it's they're they're on the bench for the first time, and Blackman leans over to Rehnquist and he says, "Now, no fooling around." <laughs> <laughs> While this uh, courtship is going on, this is the spring of her third year. She's trying to get a job. She writes forty law firms in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, and not one offers her uh, a, an interview for a lawyer. One, one of them, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, offers her uh, an interview to talk about a job as a law secretary and asks, how well can you type? And her answer is so-so. Now, flash forward 30 years. The law firm is Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. The Attorney General of the United States is William French Smith, a former Gibson, Dunn partner, and he is calling Sandra Day O'Connor at, at her home, asking her if she would come to Washington to interview with the President of the United States about being a Supreme Court Justice. And she gets on the phone and says, you wouldn't be calling me about secretarial work, would you? <laughs> uh, she, she doesn't get a job, uh, any private sector job, so she has to go to the public sector, and she goes to the, over to the DA, and she says, uh, I'd like to work for you. And he says, I don't have any money. She says, I'll work for free. He says, I don't have any space for you. And she says, I'll work off of your secretary's desk. He says, okay. She takes the job. And it's interesting to me, she, she was never bitter about this. Uh, she said, you know, I, the fact that I couldn't get a job in the private sector meant led me to the public sector where I spent the rest of my life. She um, was uh, in Germany when her husband was uh, a JAG in Germany after law school and she got a promotion to civil service level nine. She writes her parents, I'm not really too excited about it. It's the level I should have been all along. They get back to Phoenix. No Phoenix law firm will hire women, but her husband, who wasn't as good a student, gets the job at a top firm at the top of the bank building. She uh, teams up with someone she met in the bar review course and they, two of them, hang a shingle in a shopping mall, and they take anything that walks in the door. She gets to be assistant attorney general in Arizona, and she says it was so I could work two-thirds of the time for half the pay. Mm -hmm. So then, finally jumping to the legislature. Well, the, try to imagine the Arizona legislature in 1970, how hospitable it was to women. I mean, not. Uh, the guys were drinking a lot. Uh, horsing around, and she put up with it, by and large, but not always. There was a fellow named Tom Goodwin, who was the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, and, and she was the she was the majority leader of the legislature of the Senate. She had to deal with Goodwin every day, and he was a drunk, a drunk by 10 a.m. drunk, and she uh, called him on it, and he said, "If you were a man, I'd punch you in the nose." And she said, "If you were a man, you could." <laughs> But it, significantly, she didn't do that kind of thing. She picked her shots. Uh, more, more, much more often, she walked away from it. And it wasn't that she was immune to it. She, one of her assistants told me that found her in the bathroom once crying. You know, it, it hurt. But she didn't show it in public. And uh, she just had a way of, of just sucking it up and, 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 and not getting into stupid fights, not getting into sort of chest-butting ego fights, uh, saving her fights for the fights that counted. So in the legislature, she did make it her business to make sure that the state laws were changed, went going methodically through them so that any di that discriminated against women, like to start with the eight-hour work week, women could not work longer than eight hours a day, uh, that, that they were changed. Um, there were community property laws. There were uh, about 20 laws that we had, uh, we saw her yellow legal pad list of all the laws that she wanted to go through. She had some help from um, some students at a law school, and they did get changed under her watch. Um, I just this uh, interject a, a nice, um, uh, she watched how women progressed, and she never forgot the discrimination against her 
even though she was never bitter, she just, one point, the Supreme Court had a cert petition before it, and it was a, a woman who had not, who had been denied partnership in a law firm, uh, and her own clerk had done the cert pool memo recommending that the court not take the case, and she found him, he told us this, she found him and she said, did you write that? And she said, I could bring your neck. She said, of course we're taking this case. It's going to make a difference to thousands of women. So she, uh, and they did. She, um, in terms of women's progress, she was watching women around the country as they uh, got power, in effect. And she was very excited when Geraldine Ferraro was on the, the vice presidential ticket with Mondale in July 84. By now, she's been on the court for three years. And she wrote in her own journal, it warms my Republican heart to have this news. It is a great day. She said, it's high time and a very happy day. She, she didn't forget uh, the Gibson Dunn, this law firm, asked her, which is a Supreme Court justice, to speak at their 90th anniversary. And they fill a ballroom full of people. Uh, Ted Olson asked her to do it. And he told us that she First, she said, how many women lawyers do you have at Gibson Dunn? <laughs> how many associates? How many partners? And he, he answered, you can be damn sure Gibson Dunn hired a few more uh, <laughs> uh, quickly. Uh, she, she, now, she was not a, at all a conventional feminist as we understand it. She did, in fact, I don't, she didn't even use the word. Uh, she had to get along with men in a state which didn't like ardent feminists or activists. Uh, but... She was. She had this sort of subtle way of, of dealing with people, and and on the court, she needed to be subtle because they were, as we said earlier, totally glad to see her. Harry Blackman, being a case in point, Blackman was worried that she, as a Reagan appointee, would be a vote against his case, Roe v. Wade. That she would vote to overturn abor the abortion rights case, and he sniped at her and wrote critical. Uh, uh, dissents of her opinions, and he resented her celebrity. Uh, we know this because on the on the first day when she's being uh, her investiture, uh, well, a reporter says to Blackman, uh, ready for the big day, he says, is it? Uh, and then I, we had access to his papers. Uh, he's, he, he's reading, you can tell he's reading an article about her celebrity, and the fourth paragraph of this post story begins, uh, Justice Connor is recognized wherever she goes, comma, Unlike, say, comma, Harry Blackman. He, he underlines that. <laughs> uh, her, her, at least with Blackman, it was a sort of a subtle battle. She, although she did explain once to one of her cooks, I even went to his damn prayer breakfast. Uh, with Scalia, it was a little tougher uh, because well, at first she welcomed him. He was, he was full of intellectual vigor and he was lively. The court was getting a little old and dull by the late eight, 80s. So... She's glad to see Scalia, but he quickly suffers from that uh, disease known as smartest kid in the room syndrome. And the room in this case is the court's conference room. Uh, he's sending out ninograms, uh, correcting the grammar of his brethren. And, and uh, uh, even actually Justice Ginsburg told us she went to Scalia and said, you know, she was a f good friend of Scalia's and said, you're hurting yourself. You're not, you're not getting as much done here because you're, you're, you're being obnoxious. Uh, to your colleagues, and he was particularly obnoxious to Justice O'Connor. Uh, he said in a, he said that one of her dissents, he said this publicly, could not be taken seriously. This kind of intellectual contempt. She didn't take the bait. When her clerks tried to respond in, in her opinions, she'd take it out. She'd, she'd nick it out of, of the drafts. Uh, she did play tennis once with, uh, this is a game arranged by John O'Connor, who was tried to be a pal of Scalia's, and a tennis game, doubles game, and uh, O'Connor repeatedly drilled <laughs> uh, Scalia at the net. She was a better player than he was. Uh, and when it, they were done, Scalia turned to his pal, uh, Bill A, and said, we're never doing that again. <laughs> uh, uh, Ozzie, tell us about Justice Souter. Justice, when David Souter arrived at the court, uh, he is an unusual guy. He he, he didn't turn on the lights in his office um, to save electricity. He ate an apple and lunch, and he, uh, he was, uh, went to his, marched to his own drummer, and he was single. 
she thought this was a problem and that she needed to help him find a, a suitable match. So she, uh, she, call, she was going to have dinner. The O'Connors were having dinner with, uh, at the Webster's, Linda and Bill Webster. Bill was a former FBI director, CIA director. And she called Linda and she said, I'm bringing David Souter. She's, and Linda said, well, that's all right, sure. And she said, I think he needs to see how happily married couples live. <laughs> so Linda turned to Bill and she said, well, tonight we have to act happy. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so uh, she did arrange a couple dates for Souter and, and one of the dates she arranged later talked to her and said, well, it was a nice evening. And at the end of it, he said, I had a really good time. Let's do this again next year. <laughs> so so he, she gave up. Uh, Souter, she basically always got along with. Clarence Thomas was a, a more difficult challenge. Uh, you know, uh, the Anita Hill hearings, she hates that. Of course she does. But, uh, and, and Thomas arrives at the court and he, we, he told us this story. He felt hammered. He just felt terrible and lonely and alienated. And uh, after his first conference, he's walking alone back to the, his chambers. And she falls in step with him and says, uh, those hearings were very damaging. And he doesn't know what to say. Uh, he's damaging to him personally, damaging to the court. So he doesn't say anything. And she doesn't say anything. But the next day, she walks with him again and says, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And uh, he doesn't want to come to lunch. And the next day and the day after that and the day after that. And finally, she says, uh, Clarence, you got to come to lunch. And he says, yes, ma'am. And he says it changed his life on the court. Clarence Thomas is actually a very jovial, fun-loving guy with a big laugh. And after he got over sulking and being sullen, he was uh, glad to be. And, and by then, I, I mentioned earlier that when she first came to the court, only about four justices were coming to lunch. She would make it her business to go to the chambers of every justice who wasn't coming to lunch and just sit there until they came <laughs> for the lunch. And by the 90s, she has everybody coming to lunch. They don't talk about cases. Uh, they talk about sort of anything but cases. But uh, Justice Thomas said to us, that she was the glue, that she was what made the court civil. Uh, she, she, you know, she wasn't, she was, Thomas is an ideological doctrinal purist. She's not that. She's pragmatic. She's practical. She doesn't really like doctrine. In fact, she's been heavily criticized in the law reviews and by legal commentators for being a little bit too ad hoc. Uh, and you can make that criticism of her. But her, her issue was, how's this going to play practically? What's the practical impact of what we're doing up here? And also, and this is an important thing, she did not think of the court as the last word. You know, we think of that marble temple up there as the last word, the final world. She thought the court was in conversation with the other branches of government. She often wrote concurrences, sending cases, narrow concurrences, fact-based concurrences, sending the case back down to the lower courts, or inviting the legislature, the states, or Congress to do better, basically, particularly on the big issues, the tough issues, like abortion and affirmative action. And as a result, she held the decisive vote. She, although she did not like, really like affirmative action, or personally <laughs> found abortion repugnant, she preserved abortion rights and affirmative action for 25 years. She limited them, but she preserved them as part of this ongoing attempt to have the country struggle through these difficult uh, issues. As a result, when she quit and she was replaced by Sam Alito, she was <laughs> disappointed in him. She was somebody who never spoke ill of anybody, if she could possibly help it. So this is the exception. But she did privately say that she was disappointed with Alito because she was afraid and rightly so, that he was going to cast a decisive vote against abortion rights and against affirmative action and, and, and also, as he did, vote for money in the political system. She really did not like Citizens United. Why? Because she's the last justice who actually had to ask for a vote. She was the last one to be in a legislature, to be in the real world of politics. And she knew how hideous and poisonous money was. She was practical about it. So when uh, the court handed down Citizens United, she was really 
uh, very disappointed by that. Uh, Elsie, talk a little bit to us about her law clerks. We uh, interviewed 94 of her law clerks, most of her law clerks, and they were a really impressive group of people, all smart. Um, often they did something remarkable, but besides being top law review editors, she hired uh, a woman who had swum the English Channel. She really, she hired a, a juggler, someone who was a concert pianist. She hired um, a blind clerk. The first disabled clerk. The first disabled clerk. She she cast a pretty An undercover wide net. CIA agent. Yeah, Shirley Woodward. But what she really cared about was that they get along with each other, not their ideology. She figured, she did ask them, if you don't agree with me, will you be able to write the way that I have made my decision? And they always said yes. And, uh, but she really cared about them. So she wanted, as one told us, to model a balanced life, to get exercise, to give uh, to have, be sociable, to go to museums, to see the wider world and appreciate nature. And, um, and to never be above taking care of others. And to take care of others, that's right. And she, uh, she started, one, one of her first, uh, in her first week she told one of her clerks that she wanted to have an aerobics class every morning in the basketball court, which is above the Supreme Court chamber and uh, highest court in the land highest court in the land yeah (laughs) and so they duly found a a y instructor to come and uh, be their instructor and every woman in the court building was invited to participate and her two uh, she always hired two women if she could her two clerks were expected to participate. Not the men, but they were expected to stay in shape. So one of her male clerks told us that uh, one day he was eating an ice cream cone at his desk and he he saw her coming and he put the cone in his drawer. (laughs) (laughs) So She liked to take him on outings, no matter what the workload. The cherry blossoms are blooming now. Well, it was cherry blossom time and every year she would she would walk them down with them, or some would say march with them, down to the cherry blossoms in the near the tidal basin to look at how beautiful they were, and uh, she took them on outings like to the arboretum and to river rafting and baseball games. And uh, one of them, a UCLA professor, now said the arboretum wasn't like stopping to smell the roses it was like speeding up to smell the roses and learning how to be a better rose smeller (laughs) she was incredibly resilient herself and in 1988 she got breast cancer many of you might remember that and um so she at first it would surprise me that she waited a month to have a, a a um biopsy but she did, and once she heard the, the bad news, she went, uh, well, she, she actually despaired briefly, and then was, uh, when she was mistakenly told, well, not mistakenly, she was told her, her survival rate was 50-50 without chemotherapy. Um, and once she heard the odds improved dramatically with chemotherapy, she, she went for it and uh, never missed an oral argument. But she was rather appalled when the first day back on the bench, um, she looked over in the press gallery and the ABC reporter was looking at her through binoculars and, you know, trying to see if she was going to resign. Uh, She she managed to, through all this incredible life, to be a good mother. Uh, She had three sons who very uh, active, uh, successful men. One of them climbed Mount Everest. they told me that she had three rules of mother. One was be home by six, don't speak ill of other people, and don't hit your brother. That was it. <laughs> she uh, she found somehow may have found time to cook every uh, recipe in the Julia Child cookbook, and then one of her, her her women friends said, "Oh, Sandra, do you always have to overachieve?" Uh, she was a little bit that way. I don't think she ever her kids. She never was on the couch watching TV. She was. She was uh, she was relentless. 
She also had a great marriage. She, um, she and uh, she actually, John married her rather against his mother's wishes. Um, he, he remember he, uh, she was a little bit of a social climber in San Francisco. He would say that about her, the, mom. the mother. And when he first took Sandra home to meet his mother, he stopped and asked her if her fingernails were clean. <laughs> <laughs> he, he later wrote about it and said he couldn't believe he did that to her. Uh, and and she was meanwhile writing him love letters and one of the fav my favorites says uh, only 46 more days until you're doomed <laughs> <laughs> he was the you know he was the, the big man in phoenix uh he worked for the fancy law firm he was he was a guy he was a regular guy fraternity guy a country club guy he was head of the rotary uh and when he came to washington of course it didn't work out as well uh, he did not have a successful uh, law career here. Uh, he went out, he told one of uh, uh, the, the wife of another judge, uh, Mrs. Renfrew, that he was lost. He felt lost. And she knew that. And it always, uh, I was touched by this. She was famous in Washington for being sociable. She went out a lot, more than any justice ever. They were in four different dance party groups. Uh, why did she do what she and part of that was she liked to dance and she liked she was sociable but she told me that she went out partly for him to give him a chance to shine to be the the lion at dinner she would say tell us a story john and let him tell a story because she knew it was good for his ego and that he was a good dancer and that he, he liked to dance she had to read a thousand pages a night uh for the supreme court and she read them pretty quick uh but she she wanted to do this for him. Well, it worked great until he got Alzheimer's. Uh, Mid-90s, he starts showing the symptoms, and it gets harder and harder, of course. But she wants to care for him. She's not going to put him in a home, and she doesn't even want to get help from him. She brings him to the Supreme Court. He, he often is sleeping on the bench in her front office. Uh, her kids are saying, hey, uh, well, Scott told us, he said, I said, Mom, this is going to kill you. There's a, there, he'd been reading studies in the Harvard Medical Journal about uh, the longevity rates of, of caregivers, particularly with Alzheimer's, are low. And she said, I have to care for him. I just have to care for him. So she resigned from the Supreme Court to take care of John. She, she was explicit about it. He sacrificed for me. Now I'm going to sacrifice for him. And she, uh, she resigns in July of 2005. And she expects to be off the court by September. Roberts is named as her replacement. She thinks that's a he's a good uh, choice. And then Rehnquist dies in September, and she has agreed to stay on the court until she's replaced. Roberts becomes Rehnquist's replacement. And then there is the ill-fated uh, tenure of Harriet Mears, and then finally Alito is confirmed in January, and she's finally off the court. All of those months are lost to her and John because he just gets worse and worse. And, um, and that's just another piece of the, the sort of sad ending to her tenure on the court um, and, and her marriage because six months later, he, she has to put him in a memory care facility in Phoenix and she uh, he doesn't know who she is he doesn't recognize her he probably thinks she's a someone he knows and he forms a mistaken attachment which is not uncommon he he has an emotional attachment to Kay another Alzheimer's patient in the facility and so when Sandra goes to see him one day he introduces her, Kay, to Sandra as his wife. That couldn't be sadder. And so she, another time, comes to see him, and he's holding Kay's hand, and she sits down and holds his other hand. And um, there, uh, in the Washington Post columnist, and I think it was Dana Milbank, not sure about that, writes a column that's headed, so this is, in the end, what love looks like. 
which I think is lovely. She to to the of course then she gets Alzheimer's. Uh, dementia, dementia. The, the, well, the, the, the diagnosis is dementia, comma, probably Alzheimer's because she got it sufficiently late that they can't know for sure. But her, she, she dreaded this. She knew her, her mother had it, her aunt had it, and it, it came for her. But she kept plugging. We went out there to see her, and I, when this, this book started, she had starting to have symptoms, but I watched her work a room of 150 people, and you never would have known it. Uh, Suter was there and called her toots. Uh, uh, and she, her, she, she kept on plugging for the things that she cared about. And one was judicial independence. Uh, again, she'd been a state court judge and she knew what that was like. Uh, and the other was, and this is her real legacy, was her, her faith in civility and in civics. Uh, civility, she, was, she understood that government runs not just the rules of government, but the little informal courtesies <coughs> the small ways that people are supposed to treat each other. And I thought it was significant that her last public statement came after Merrick Garland had been nominated by Obama, but the Republican Senate would not confirm him. Her last public statement was, oh, come on, <laughs> let's get on with it. Uh, and that's so, that's so her. Uh, she said her legacy, her, her greatest legacy, was not the Supreme Court, but starting something called iCivics. iCivics is... Uh, video games for middle schoolers to teach them about government, uh, how a bill passes Congress, or you can pretend to be the president. or uh, and, and this now reaches 5 million kids a year. Uh, she, she couldn't even do inter emails herself, but she was smart enough to get behind this organization. She created this organization uh, that teaches civics to kids. And I thought it was, it was classic that she thought that that was her, her greatest achievement. Thank you very much. Happy to happy to take questions. I think you line up at the at the mics. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, um, as I started as I started reading the book, one th as I started reading the book, one thing that I was wondering, um, as I started reading the as I started browsing through the book, I, I read some about Justice O'Connor's. I read about Justice O'Connor's relationship with Justice Thurgood Marshall, and I was wondering what I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about that. What were some of the most interesting things that you learned that you learn that you learned in your research that you learned when doing your research about the relationship and interactions between Marshall and O'Connor? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Ju Justice O'Connor grew up without much exposure to African Americans because in the Lazy Bee, she, she just, there, there, were, there were none. Uh, and in Phoenix, a very small African American population. So the effect of that, there was, she had one friend in the legislature, a guy named Art Hamilton. But the effect was that she came to the Supreme Court and it was Thurgood Marshall who taught her what it was like to be a black man in America. He was, he liked to tell stories in conference. Uh, when other people are talking about the cases, he would talk about, am I, uh, talk about what it was like to be a black lawyer in the South in the 1930s and 1940s when people are chasing you out of town with a shotgun. And it was incredibly meaningful to her, these stories. And they became good friends, he, uh, and, and really good friends, a couple of things. He came to her once, and he was, he was not the happiest Supreme Court justice. Marshall was not. Uh, and he was feeling low, and he was feeling blue, and that he wasn't really doing his job. And she said to him, oh, come on, Thurgood, if you had never come here, you would have done more for civil rights or for American history than the rest of us put together. Uh, I also noted one other thing that's touched me. Uh, I f we found in her papers uh, that she had kept the program to Thurgood Marshall's funeral. And she wrote on it uh, something that he had said to her, uh, got to got, do things, the only things I have to do are to die and be black. She wrote that on his on his funeral program. Obviously, it, you know, it meant something to her. Thank you both very much. You made a great team presentation, sort of playing off of each other. I appreciated that. Uh, just a quick anecdote. Um, of course, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, I mean, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale were the great Eastern 
coast universities, and Stanford was very much a Johnny-come-lately. To make matters worse, it was named formally after Leland Stanford Jr. So the put-down was this was a junior university. <laughs> uh, she knows better. <laughs> This was very interesting. Uh, I've always thought it was a tragedy that uh, uh, O'Connor resigned when she did, uh, and then her husband deteriorated yes. so quickly because she was uh, such a valuable voice on the court. Uh, I didn't realize that she got dementia also. Um, so I was wondering, A, how long after she resigned, and B, uh, sounds as if you interviewed her a fair amount, so yeah. well, you were able to do so uh, despite her condition? It, it was, it, she started showing symptoms in about, she was diagnosed in 2014, mm -hmm. but it, it was slow and progressive. Now she's, uh, She's in bed, not in great shape. I saw her two weeks ago. We were both there with her. And uh, she's not in great shape. When we began this process, she could talk. I didn't, we didn't really talk to her about the, her cases. We talked to her about growing up on the Lazy Bee, about her family, about her marriage. We saw her about six times. She's not heavily quoted in the book. The greatest thing she did for us was to write a letter mm -hmm. to all of her colleagues. We interviewed seven justices, mm -hmm. her law clerks, her friends, asking them to talk to us. So mm -hmm. the book is really written from their perspective looking in at her, not so much from her perspective looking back out. Although we did have The Lazy Bee, which she had written. It's a beautiful little book about life on the ranch. And also we had her journal and we had her husband's diary. And so we had a lot of her perspective. We had um, a voice from Through from that, that, those yeah. voices. She, when she resigned from the court, she said, I have about five years to her kids to be relevant. And then after she'd been relevant for five years, she said, she, I have another five years. So she had a good stretch of time. She did say uh, that she regretted uh, stepping down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. yeah. You might mention how, how becoming she was. They, uh, she had violet eyes, as I recall. Uh, <laughs> like, like none other in the, Hazel, in the actually, but the, the people said they were violet. Uh, it's uh, interesting. Everybody said she had blazing blue eyes and Hazel, but... Actually, she had hazel eyes, but, but I should defer well, to you. Um, <laughs> uh, and how generous she was to other people, young people. Uh, yes. She would take uh, uh, samples of their writing that she couldn't have time to read during the term and on her summer holiday would uh, and sometimes write very nice little notes back saying that she liked whatever it was. Mm. Nice how, how did you know her? Uh, we had an adjacent court on the uh, under the under the bubble uh, in uh, where we played tennis, oh, and when you changed courts, <laughs> you 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 came close to, to royalty. <laughs> Very nice, sir. Hi, right, and thank you. Yes, great team. I, I, I second that uh, co earlier comment. Um, I'm interested in well, kind of to begin with, interested in this uh, idea that uh, initially her reception from the other eight was condescending <laughs> in some cases, even chilly in some, some cases. Case. Uh, and presumably that changed a lot on her route to uh, become swing vote, you know, and the most powerful person, if you want to express it in those terms. Um, kind of generally, is the, is the relationship between the justices and in her specific case, the route of you know her re relationship with the other justices, influenced particularly by this, you know, sort of, position in, in the center, um, how, do, how does that work in general and how did it, or how does it, how did it work in her case? In the court, we were interested to find, they don't talk much to each other. In conference, they do not debate the cases. They give their vote and their, their reasoning and that's, and then they move on. They communicate largely by memos. They write right. memos to each other. And it's a very, these memos are very principled, highly technical legal memos. Now there's often sort of a subtext and it helps to talk to the clerks were involved to figure out what the subtext is. But it is a, to the credit of the institution, quite a principled argument. You're not going to find log rolling or, you know, vote trading. They're not trading sewer culverts or highways. It's a very principled thing. Having said that, at the end of the day, 
They're pretty pre- on the big cases. They're pretty predictable. The liberals vote one way. The conservatives vote the other. So, right. yes, they are political creatures. And she was, too. Uh, she was not as predictable as others, but she was within the court. Uh, you know, when she wanted to get uh, Wizard White's vote, she would walk down the hall and putt with him in his chambers. Uh, she uh, we haven't talked about Ruth Bader Ginsburg at all, but this is probably a good time to do it. Mm-hmm. Ginsburg's arrived 12 years after her, and uh, O'Connor was very glad to see her. Uh, for one thing, they finally put in a ladies' bathroom near the conference. Oh, I heard that. Uh, but also because they were they were allies on on many issues, and uh, Sandra helped Ruth uh, uh, when 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 Ginsburg told us this, uh, uh, given a rough case to start, and. Uh, as, O'Connor said to her, oh, just do it, Ruth, just do it, which is very her, and then get another case. I mean, and, and Ruth told us that story. Right. Justice Ginsburg told us that story. Uh, but Justice Ginsburg also said that not once did Justice O'Connor come to her chambers to talk about a case, which says something about how the institution works. Justice O'Connor did, Justice Ginsburg did go to Justice O'Connor's chambers. I'll let Osi tell this story. She uh, she also told us this. We had heard from Justice O'Connor's uh, messenger and driver, sometimes driver, that uh, Justice Ginsburg had hit Justice O'Connor's car in the parking lot. And Justice Twice. Ginsburg learned the second to time was hit and run. drive when she was 30. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg grew up in New York. She learned to drive when she was 30. O'Connor learned to drive when she was 10. And so... so so we said nervously at the last question to Justice Ginsburg, uh, did you hit Justice O'Connor's car? And she, she said, I did, I did, I've never driven again. And then, <laughs> and then she said, and then she said, so I went up to her chambers and I said, Sandra, I've done a very bad thing. And Sandra said, oh Ruth, you never do anything bad. And Ruth said, I hit your car. And Sandra said, I just got it out of the body shop. <laughs> she also told us that, uh, that she hit Justice O'Connor's car because she was trying to avoid hitting Justice Scalia's car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I really enjoyed Ike's Bluff, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to reading that. I, I thought it was a terrific book, so I'm looking forward to it. And I love the cover. Yes, the cover thank is you. Really lovely. Thank you. Um, I had the um, good fortune of interviewing her. I was a managing editor of the American Association of University Women in the 80s, mm-hmm. and we gave her an award, an achievement award. So she gave me 45 minutes of her time in her chamber, which was an enormous amount of time for yeah. just a, you know, a small organization giving her uh, an award um, and while I was and then she she hooked me up with a, a tour of the Supreme Court which is fascinating you know there are things about it the spittoons in the back in the dressing room and everything um, but while I was interviewing her um, I did ask her I thought I'll just slip this in there <laughs> what about a case on abortion and uh, I thought maybe <laughs> and she said Oh no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be proper to answer that question. Yeah. She said, "Oh no, it wouldn't be proper to answer a question like that." Yeah. And she was super judicious, sure. you know, and and humble, and um, just lovely, yeah. a lovely person. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she had a terrific collection of Southwest Indian uh, yes. American Indian art. She did. Anyway, I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you. I remember yeah. just a, a following up on that point about what she could feel comfortable talking about Jack Valenny, the MPA um, lobbyist. lobbyist president, really powerful guy in town, years ago came up to her uh, and said, I was just at the court today. Um, you heard an argument in a case. I want to talk to you about it. And she just turned around and walked away. Mm. One more, okay. right here. Uh, you've written on so many subjects. From the wise man to John Paul Jones to the battle for Leite Gulf and now to Sandra Day O'Connor. How do you write on such a diversity of things? My wife helps me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I did write it. (laughs) But she... Read read the acknowledgments. Read the acknowledgments. acknowledgements. Yeah. Read the acknowledgments. (laughs) 
I, I'm, can I say one thing? Sure, sure. You haven't asked me about Bush v. Gore. We don't talk. We don't talk about it because we wait for the questions because there's all. So I'm sort of surprised, especially in this crowd. There's not a question. How the hell did she do Bush v. Gore? So I'm going to quickly tell you. Just the background. You may recall it's the election is basically a tie in Florida. It's a mess. Uh, the recount goes on. The vote recount goes on. Of course, it gets to the Supreme Court, and this is a bad day for the court because the court stops the recount. Five Republicans. <coughs> Five conservatives vote to stop the recount with the effect of electing Bush. And four liberals vote for Gore. Looks like raw, naked politics. So we often get asked about this. What was Justice O'Connor doing? Now, Justice O'Connor was a uh, Republican, to be sure. And her husband sure didn't like Al Gore. But really what was going on here with her is that she hated messes. And she could look down. We've got a little bit of this from Justice Ginsburg. She looked down the road that if the recount was allowed to continue, a Republican secretary of state had already certified Bush electors. So you had one slate of electors certified. If Gore got ahead, there was going to be a second set of electors. Believe it or not, there's a law for what happens. 3 U.S.C. 15. And it says that if there are two sets of electors, it goes to Congress. And the House has one vote and the Senate has one vote. And the House was... Republican, and the Senate was Democratic, so it was going to be a tie. In the case of a tie, the tie is broken by the governor of the state. His last name was Bush, <laughs> Jeb Bush. So it was going to look like a banana republic, and she just, it was going to look like the guy's brother elected him. So she, her view was, let's get this over with, do it now, take the hit. She, she really did take a hit. She said to her son that morning, uh, half the country is going to hate me, and she was right about that. Uh, uh, she didn't, she goes pretty, she didn't express regrets easily, but after about 12 years, she did say to the Chicago Tribune, maybe we shouldn't have taken that case. That's it. Thanks very Thank much. You. for coming.